Today, and I want to just say to the graduates and their families that uh, it's been an amazing privilege to watch them grow up before our eyes, to turn from children into incredible young men and women who are really devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. For those that have graduated from college and for those of you that have actually gone beyond with uh, postgraduate degrees, we want to just again say how proud we are. I feel like I know all of you, and it's been a joy to watch your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ play out, not just here, but, but when you're away on campus and in your daily lives. What an incredible joy to see what God is doing in you right now and to imagine what He's going to do in the future. Uh, Jason quoted a verse earlier from the book of Jeremiah. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to talk about the promise, the promise of a bright future. We've been talking about some of the great promises that God has made for us in His Word, and uh, today's no different. We're going to talk about the, the promise of a bright future, Jeremiah 29, 11. The problem is we can't just preach that verse. We've got to preach, really, that verse in the context that it's given to us, and so we're going to walk through that chapter. This is really one of those special verses in the Bible. In fact, it may be one of our favorites. I mean, I hear it often. Uh, we'll be having a luncheon right after the service for our graduates and their families, and usually at least one parent, sometimes more, will have selected Jeremiah 29, 11, and they'll read that verse to their student, to their graduate, and, and they'll read it, and sometimes they'll read it with tears in their eyes, and yet they will read it with conviction because they really believe that God has something special for their student. I read a story recently about a woman who was facing her fifth major surgery to correct what was described as a severe curvature of the spine. And a reporter was interviewing her and asked her how she could have such infectious uh, you know, optimism and how could your spirits be so up? And she quoted Jeremiah 29, 11. I read about another woman in Alabama who was raised in an abusive home wound up in an abusive relationship, and while she was living in a halfway house, she found Jeremiah 29, 11, and that verse gave her the power, it gave her the strength, the motivation to begin breaking some lifelong self-destructive patterns of behavior. Now, this verse is special. It's filled with some unique reassurances, and it's really worth putting to memory by all of us. The Bible says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope, hope, real hope, and a future, a bright future. This verse is significant. This verse is great because it tells us that God has a specific plan for each of us. So let me just say this again. God has a plan for you as a graduate or as a parent of a graduate. You may be midlife. God has a plan for you. You may be going through those years where you're empty nesting. And, and I want to say God has a plan for your life. You may be a grandparent. You may be nearing retirement or enjoying retirement. God has a very specific plan for you. This plan is designed to prosper us. It is not designed to harm us. Many people think that God just has it in for them and that He walks around with a big club and He waits for any opportunity to pound you over the head. That is a really ugly, ugly caricature of God. It's false. God loves you. And He has a plan for your life. And when you and I realize that God's not out to get us, He's out to bless us and use us, it really gives us a renewed sense of hope for a bright future. I think we need that. All of us need that. Now, when, when you read this verse in its context, you realize very quickly that this verse is about and for people who are not at the moment where they want to be. That's important. This verse is directed to people who are for the very moment that this was given to them, they're somewhere they don't want to be. If you're here this morning and you feel like you've heard yourself thinking out loud, I don't like where I am in life. I don't like what's happening to me. I don't like the people around me. I don't like my circumstances. I don't like my situation. Maybe, 
maybe this morning this verse will have some special meaning for you. Now the best way to study a verse like this, really any verse for that matter, is to look at it within its setting or within its context. That is where it occurs. And so I want to describe for you briefly a little bit of the background of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And uh, the background is given to us in the very uh, first three verses of chapter 29 of Jeremiah. Let me read it to you. You may have a different translation, but my translation says, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans, had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So the author of this letter is the prophet Jeremiah. We sometimes call him the weeping prophet. Not because he was a crybaby, but because he preached and he ministered with such incredible passion in the most heartbreaking of times. All around him was suffering and All around him, he was seeing the collapse of his country. The nation of Judah was being systematically disassembled and destroyed before his very eyes, and it broke his heart. They were being overwhelmed and overtaken by the Babylonians. Large numbers of people, including members of the royal family of Judah, were being rounded up, killed, or hauled away to refugee camps in Babylon. The nation of Judah was teetering on the brink of famine and many, many folks, many Judeans were already in Babylon, but but Jeremiah was, he was among the remaining people still trapped in what many refer to as that encircled city of Jerusalem. They were trapped. And he knew that every passing day took him deeper into the disaster and closer to the utter defeat and destruction of his beloved nation, and he knew that judgment was inevitable. Listen to me. He knew as a man of God, judgment was inevitable. But, 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 there were some false prophets and and a group of people the Bible calls diviners in both Judah and among the refugee camps in Babylon who were saying something completely opposite. They were saying something like this. Hey, it may look bad right now, but the Lord's going to come through for us. Hey, all you refugees will soon be back at home in Judah and and, and we're going to get delivered. And somehow a miracle is right around the corner. I mean, it's just waiting for us. Expect a miracle. Expect a miracle. But Jeremiah's message didn't sync up with that. In fact, it was exactly the opposite message. Jeremiah was preaching, no. No, the Lord's not going to save us this time from the Babylonians. Uh, He was saying stuff like this, "We're, we're out of miracles. Our sins have so alienated us from God that only judgment is left. And yet, he says, even here the judgment of God is tinged with grace, and it will lead to mercy. It may take 70 years, but God Almighty will reestablish our nation, and His ultimate plans are unstoppable. His purposes, that is, the purposes of God are stubborn and will always win out in the end. That's the message that the weeping prophet Jeremiah was preaching to the frightened survivors in Jerusalem But he also wanted to communicate that same message to the refugees who had already been deported hundreds of miles away in Babylon. That's what this letter is all about. Jeremiah 29 is a remarkable document. Jeremiah 29 is a record of an actual ancient letter that Jeremiah sent to the refugees who'd been deported to the empire of Babylon. That's what's going on. That's the background. Now, let's look at the text itself, the text of the letter, and 
quickly I'll try to point out some instruction that God gives us. And I think these instructions are incredibly relevant for all of you who are graduating. Uh, they're relevant for all of us who are just simply living out our lives. So whether you're graduating from high school or college or some other type of degree or whether you're just sort of you know, getting up out of bed every day and, and trudging through life and trying your best to put one foot in front of the other, th these instructions from the prophet Jeremiah are incredibly beneficial, okay? Very, very relevant. See, we live in a society that's very similar to where they were. We're living in a decadent and dangerous society. We're, we're living, many Bible preachers believe, we're living in the last days. Uh, we live in a nation that is poised for the judgment of God. Not an easy thing to say. And when we see how thoroughly and adamantly our country has turned away from God and from godliness, how we've rejected, for the most part, our Judeo-Christian heritage, that gave America its birth and its greatness, then, then all of us are witnesses to the righteousness or the rightness of God's judgment. So as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, living in an ungodly land during an ungodly time, what can we learn from this passage about living in these crucial and critical days? I, I hope there'll be a few things that you can tuck inside your heart this morning before we leave. Number one, Jeremiah really says, make the best of things. Just wherever you are, just make the best of things. I know that sounds like a cliche for positive thinkers, but it's really solid biblical advice. In fact, it's exactly what Jeremiah said, and we see it in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, This is what the Lord Almighty... The God of Israel says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, don't decrease. Jeremiah's point, I think, is straightforward. It's very simple. He says there's not going to be a last-minute miracle. There's not going to be some sort of sudden solution to this problem of being deported to Babylon. Things aren't going to get better. They're probably going to get worse. There's no quick fix. There's no shortcut. There's, there's no miracle around the corner. There, there may be hope for our long-term prospects, but in the meantime, in the meantime, things aren't going to be like you want them to be. Strap in, get ready, but in the process, he says, make the most of it. Sometimes all you can do in life is make the most of it. Look at that verse in and uh, that phrase in verse 5, he says, settle down, settle down. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do. Just settle in for the long haul and decide no matter what comes at me, I'm, I'm going to be faithful. Hey, for the next four years as you pursue your college degree and then perhaps uh, uh, some kind of postgraduate degree, settle down and decide that you're not going to be bullied or pushed away from your faith. Settle down and continue to read the Bible and embrace the truth of the Scriptures and, and pray and, and share the good news and be willing to be ridiculed and sometimes worse than ridiculed for your stand, your devotion, your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Settle down and, and get on with your life. He says build houses and Plant gardens, accept the fact that you're probably never going to see Judah or Jerusalem again in this life. But just make the most of it where you are. Get married. Have kids. Be hopeful. Increase. Don't decrease. Don't give up. I tell people all the time, it's always too early to give up. Don't give up. You may not be where you want to be, and things may not be going like you want them to go, at least in this life, but, but just make the most of where you are right now. Some people say it like this, bloom where you're planted. Quit looking over into the other uh, person's yard. The grass isn't greener. It's got the same problems as your lawn. It's got the same challenges that you face. Sometimes... 
To be quite honest, there's nothing you can do in life sometimes to change your circumstances. What I mean is, and I, I want to be very clear, sometimes you're powerless to change what's happening. Now, now you may hear differently from some that preach, but the biblical record is very accurate. Sometimes you are utterly powerless to change what's going on around you, but you are always in control of how you respond. Things might change, but only in time. Jeremiah says right now, you've got to make the most of it. You've got to do the best you can. You've got to rejoice in the Lord and keep on going. Do the best where you are. Don't give up. Don't spend your time wishing that something had or, or had not happened. Just settle in and settle down and do the best you can right where you are. At school, at work, in a difficult marriage, in other difficult relationships, in a church. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're about. He says things may not change for a long time, but, but here's how you can address the situation. You live out your calling for God every single day, regardless. Do the best you can right where you are. Secondly, he says pray. Pray for peace and prosperity wherever you are right now. Look at verse 7. Jeremiah says, Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city for which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers you too will prosper. That makes sense, doesn't it? Hey, if you pray for where you are, the place where you may be exiled to, your campus, your office, your school, your club, whatever, if you pray, God, I pray for peace and prosperity. He says, I want you to do that because if that place or that organization prospers, you too will prosper. Jeremiah was telling the people, pray for your enemies. Don't curse them. Pray for them. Pray for the nation for where you've been exiled. Pray for the Babylonians. Pray for peace. Pray for prosperity of that particular nation. I mean, it seems counterintuitive, but God says, uh, pray for them. Now, the words peace and prosperity are not actually in the original Hebrew language. In fact, the original Hebrew word is shalom. He's saying, pray for the shalom of the nation where you are. And that Hebrew word shalom means peace, it means welfare, it means prosperity. And that's where we get this, this kind of wording from. So it gives us a clue of how we should be praying today. We pray for peace and prosperity for the United States of America. We pray for peace and prosperity for our world. We pray for peace, the shalom of God for our city, our church, our homes, our schools. I mean, these are the things we're concerned about. These are the things that drive us to our knees. He says, I want you to pray for the economy. I want you to pray for marriages. I want you to pray for your enemies. Pray for their peace and their prosperity, because if I bless them, you're going to be blessed as well. So we pray. We pray for the good things of God, the peace and the prosperity of God, the shalom of God, even in situations that are not bright and even for people who may not be kind. We pray for peace and prosperity. Third, Jeremiah warns for the people to beware of the wrong voices. Man, if there was ever a word to... to a needy group of people. It would be for those of us who are leaving the, the safety net of our homes, our families, our churches, and our youth groups, our churches, and, and, and being sort of thrust into this university setting, which at times is very, well, all the time, unapologetic about the frontal assault on faith. Unless, of course, you happen to wind up going to school on a Christian campus. And sometimes, and I really mean this, sometimes even so-called Christian campuses are not very sympathetic to the things of God at all either. We just have to be very careful. He says, beware of wrong voices. Jeremiah had told the people, settle down, make the best of it, pray for peace and prosperity. And then he warns, don't, don't listen to everything. Don't listen to everybody. Don't be taken in 
by wrong vo voices. Look at verse 8 and 9. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Don't let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Don't let the preachers deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying, they are preaching lies to you in my name. He says, I haven't sent them, declares the Lord. I don't believe there's ever been a time such as ours when so much crazy propaganda is being directed to so many unthinking people through so many mesmerizing venues and the results are that our nation's being desensitized and morally deprogrammed. I'm telling you, it's amazing. All kinds of false news, propaganda designed to discourage, demoralize, and pull you away from a faith relationship to God through Jesus Christ. The wrong dresses itself up in costumes of righteousness and that which is right and good is being tarred and feathered as being bad and evil. Well, how do we sort of shore up our, our thinking and our, our listening ears? The easiest way that you and I can begin to think on a higher level and learn how to listen for what is right is to begin, and I really mean this, to begin the simple practice, if you haven't already, to begin, and, and I'll say to nurture the simple practice of reading your Bible every single day. That's why we gave you Bibles. Not because it's a religious book and we're a religious organization, but because the Scripture is the divine Word of God. Uh, David said, uh, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Scripture is a light and a lamp. It, it guides us. It feeds us. It, it nurtures our faith. It shows us where we're wrong and it teaches us how to be right. It equips us so that we might be fully enabled to serve the Lord our God in any and every circumstance. I'm going to tell you, I learned a long time ago that, that these people that examine counterfeit money the, 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 the way they're trained is not studying counterfeits. The way they treat these, teach these agents that, that are to spot counterfeit money is they study the real McCoy. They study real money, real money, real money. They become so hypersensitive to what the real money looks like that they can spot them a, a fake a mile away. I want to say invest yourself in studying and reading and meditating upon God's Word. And, and listen, here's the result. When you are approached or when you are confronted with a false idea, a false philosophy, you will recognize it for what it is that quick when you have drenched yourself, saturated yourself with God's Word. And that's good advice for all of us. Amen? Saturate yourself with God's Word. Fourth, he says, take the long view. This is hard for all of us. Look past where you are. We're, we are so easily destroyed and distracted by our current set of circumstances. But, but Jeremiah says, look, take the long view. Remember that your long-term prospects are, are better than your immediate circumstances. Look at verse 10. He says, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed in Babylon... I'll come back to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. When 70 years are up, I'm coming back for all of you and I'm bringing you home. Now, now this is important. The deportation associated with the removal of King Jehoiachin occurred around 597 B.C. The complete collapse and fall of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem happened 11 years later in 586. On several specific occasions, Jeremiah preached and predicted that the nation of Judah would be destroyed, the capital city burned, the people deported, and the entire nation would be wiped off the face of the earth. But he reminded them that 70 years later, Judah would make a comeback, that the nation would be gloriously reestablished. Now, now, Daniel was in on this and actually got to read some of those ancient predictions 
and which enabled Jerusalem and Judah to become a famous and, and stalwart city again. But here's the point that I'm trying to drive at. Our long-term prospects are always better than our immediate circumstance. We're living in a time when everybody wants immediate gratification. Uh, I, when I graduate, I want my best job, and I want it now, and, and I don't want to have to wait. I don't want to have to pay my dues. I, I want everything now. But Christians are to be looking forward to the future, to God's faithfulness and to His promises, and finally to His assurance of our heavenly home. Things are going to get better, and it doesn't matter where you are in your life. Listen to me, because I don't want you to misinterpret me as being some kind of gospel, uh, you know, uh, prosperity preacher. But, but hear me, things are going to get better. You say, well, what if I die? Most definitely, things are going to get better if you know God. Amen? I'm just telling you. 2 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul said something that I believe Jeremiah would agree with. Therefore, we don't lose heart. We don't give up. We don't get discouraged. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed every single day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, he says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen. We don't focus on what's going on. We put our focus on what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but what we can't see is eternal. Do you all get it? Things may completely disintegrate around us. I'm telling you today, not because I'm a false preacher of prosperity, but a good news proclaiming preacher who believes God's word, it's, it's going to get better. If they throw you in prison and, and they throw away the key, it's going to get better. All they can do is lock you up and let you rot. And I'm it's going to get better. The prognosis may be fatal and you may die, but trust me, if you're in Christ, it's going to get better. You may be separated from people you love and people you want to be with, but someday, if you're all in Christ, there's going to be a great gathering. It's going to get better. They can rob you, beat you, starve you of everything that is dear to you in life. But someday, if Christ is in you, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. 100 years from now, it's going to get better. A thousand years from now, it's going to get better. A million years from now, it's going to get better. When we've been there, the, the hymn says, when we've been there, how long? 10,000 years bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise. How? Than when we what? Than when we first begun. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you better believe this. It's going to get better. Don't you focus on some of the obstacles, some of the pit stops, some of the setbacks, some of the hurts and the bruises, the delays, it's, it's going to all get better if you'll fix your eyes on what is unseen. Jesus, eternity, the truth of God's Word. Fifth, he says, take hope in God's plans and purposes for your life. We're going to finish here really quick. This brings us to that great verse, verse 11 Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I plan to prosper you and not to harm you. I plan to give you a hope and a future. Now, these words were spoken to men and women who had been displaced, defeated, and, and depressed. They were exiles. They had hung their harps on the willow trees, the Bible says, in a foreign land. And they said, How can we sing the songs of Zion in such a strange place? But with the Lord, things are never hopeless. Young people, with Christ, life is never without hope. God says, I, I've got plans for you. I want to prosper you. I don't want to harm you. I want to give you hope, and I want to give you a future. 
that's incredibly bright. Some of you probably think that you know exactly where you're headed today. Uh, some of my reading indicates that you may change your mind before you graduate. You may change it more than once. And I'm not saying that to discourage parents who are paying a lot of bills to put our children through college, but, but, but a four-year degree can turn into a five-year degree pretty quickly as we find out, man, this is not what I really thought I wanted to do. This is not what I think God's calling me to do. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of time and effort to discover. But you may wind up graduating and get someplace and still find, man, I, this is not what I hoped for. It's not what I would believed would be, but don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. God says, if you'll stick with me, I'll make your future bright. Finally, the next couple of verses, verse 13 and verse 14, remind us that since God wants to prosper us, give us hope and a future, we, we need to be seeking Him with a whole heart. Not, not half-heartedly, but completely devoted to Christ. We need to seek Him. The scripture says, then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me. Listen to this promise, and I'll listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from the nations and the places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So this passage reminds us that Jesus was speaking something very similar in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if you're here this morning, and you're not exactly where you want to be today, or you wind up as a graduate 5, 10, 15 years down the road somewhere where you really don't want to be, make the best of it. For the glory of God, bloom where you're planted. Pray. Pray where you are. Pray for that place is peace and prosperity for your office. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your job. Pray for the people that you work with and, and that you associate with. Pray where you are and pray for peace and prosperity. Beware, always beware of wrong voices. Elevate God's Word in your life to a place where it guides you in your thinking and in your behavior. Take the long view, man. God's at work. There may be some really rough and rocky roads, and you may go around some, some curves that are absolutely treacherous in life, but just take the long view. It's, it's going to get better. Be hopeful. Be hopeful about God's plans. And finally, seek Him. Seek Him with your whole heart. God loves you. Graduates, he loves you. Man, He's committed to you. He has plans for you. He wants to prosper you and He wants to give you a hope and a future that, quite frankly, we can't really describe for you today. Maybe you've graduated so long ago you can't hardly remember. God loves you. And He has a plan for your life. And those instructions pertain to you as well. Maybe Maybe you're here this morning as a guest of one of these precious graduates. And uh, you're not exactly someone who would describe yourself as a Christ follower. You're not a Christian. You're not a church member. You're not very religious. But, but you find yourself at a place in your life where you're just really unsettled, not happy. And you're wondering what to do. You're looking for a fresh start, a new beginning I want to say to you that I would never encourage you, hey, you know what you need to do? Become religious. No, no, that's the worst thing that, that I could tell you today. But if that describes you, if you're here and you just sort of, you feel like you're groping, don't become religious, but give yourself to a God who claims in His Word that He created you 
He made you fearfully and wonderfully. He knows you inside and out. He wants to be intimate with you. And despite the fact that we have sinned and fallen short of His glory, He, by His grace and mercy and overwhelming love, gave us His only begotten Son, who left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, a substitutionary death, which made payment for our sins. He was buried, but he came back to life on the third day, and finally he ascended back to heaven where he resides at the right hand of God. And the scripture says he ever lives to make intercession for those of us who call ourselves God's children. If you don't know him today, he extends open arms to you. If you're thirsty, come. If you're hungry, run. Run to the cross. Run to Jesus, the author and giver of life. If you know him, let the instructions that Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, gave so many thousands of years ago let those instructions become relevant for you this morning, whether you're graduating or retiring. God says, man, I've got some plans to bless you, to prosper you, to give you a future that's filled over the top with overwhelming hope. Let's stand up and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as the musicians come and as the rest of the staff joins me, Lord, in your name we approach you with a deep sense of gratitude, a deep, deep sense of gratitude for your word, for what you've done, for what you've said. Lord, all of us in this room can identify with those instructions. All of us can identify with being somewhere, sometime where we didn't exactly want to be, facing some obstacle that we didn't want to have to face dealing with people we really didn't like or want to have to deal with. Lord, sometimes being in a place where we weren't exactly happy, and yet, and yet the Scripture says you have a plan for us that ensures a bright, hope or a bright future that's filled with hope. Help us to run to you. Regardless of our station in life or stage in life, help us to run to you and surrender to you. If there's even one individual in this room that's never truly been saved, if they've never really trusted you alone to be their Savior and their God, I pray that today they'll come out and take one of us by the hand and say, I, I need Jesus. I, I need that forgiveness. I need that change that you described a few moments ago. Now, for those of us that know you, help us to lay everything down on your altar again, fresh, and to make ourselves completely available to you as we march forward with these promises for a bright future. In Jesus' name, we pray in believing faith. Amen. We're going to wait for a few moments. If God has spoken to your heart, you come as Brandon sings.